Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our next Wednesday night Bible study. Last week, you may remember, we finished up our look at the book of Job. We spent about three or four months there. Most of that, of course, the last couple of months under these uh, unusual conditions. If uh, you missed some parts of the study in the book of Job, uh, the last two months are actually here on Facebook. You can access them on our Facebook Live account. All those videos are still there. They've also, most of them, I believe, have been loaded up on our YouTube channel. We have a First Baptist Church of London, Arkansas YouTube channel. So if you have missed some of the studies in the book of Job that we did over the last three or four months, uh, most of those can be found either on our Facebook page. You have to scroll through some of the history or even on our YouTube page. So, uh, you, or, yeah. So you, you can go back and you can find those. Tonight, we're starting a new uh, series, a, a new look at a book at the book of Jonah. So we went from Job, now we're in Jonah. And I invite you to go ahead and take a Bible out tonight and go ahead and find that smaller book, only four chapters in what's sometimes called the Minor Prophets of the Old Testament. So go ahead, uh, find a Bible, uh, get a pen and paper, uh, get ready to, to have some fun here as we begin tonight and to just simply introduce ourselves tonight to the book and the story of Jonah. So as you do that, if I were to ask you uh, tonight, what is perhaps the one thing you associate more than any other thing when you hear the name Jonah? I'm going to uh, guess that it's probably a big fish. It's probably, Jonah is probably one of the very first Bible stories we remember for many of us knowing and hearing about because of the spectacular account of him being swallowed by a fish. And by the way, the Bible does say fish, not whale. And uh, so that's probably the first thing that most of us associate with the name and the story of Jonah. It might interest you to know that uh, of the four chapters of Jonah, only three verses even reference the fish. The fish is really almost incidental to the story of Jonah and really has nothing to do with the larger point and themes of the book. So uh, obviously we'll get to that, but that really isn't the main point or the main thrust of the story of Jonah. So hopefully you have by now found uh, your copy of God's Word and you are now opened to the book of Jonah. Let's begin by reading. We're going to only really read the first three or so verses just to introduce ourselves and we're just going to do some intro work tonight. And the next week, we'll dive into the balance of chapter one. But tonight, we're going to do an overview of the entire story and give us uh, take a look at some big picture themes, if you will. So let's read the first three verses of Jonah. Verse one, chapter one. The Lord of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now that's obviously not very far. We may not even really get through that tonight. Again, we want to just do some background work to give you some context here. And as we get into the book of Jonah, the context really does make a difference. The things that perhaps the early readers of this book uh, from the Old Testament would have known and would have understood. So first of all this, when is Jonah around? When is he a prophet? And do we know of him elsewhere in the scriptures? Well, actually, we do. We know that Jonah was a prophet in the first portion of the 800s BC, uh, during the reign of a guy by the name of Jeroboam II of the northern kingdom of Israel. So just a quick refresher here. This is the period around 790 to 750 B.C. Uh, Israel, not long before this, after the reigns of Saul, then David, and then Solomon, uh, had split into two kingdoms. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam uh, really made some poor decisions that resulted in a revolt. And we very quickly had a divided kingdom. You had the southern portion centered in Jerusalem. Uh, called Judah, and you have the northern tribes, which is pretty much all the other tribes of Israel, uh, centered in Samaria under the reign of the first Jeroboam. And so by the time we get to the 700s, uh, it's been a hundred something years thereabouts since Solomon uh, was around, 
and the kingdom had been split. Uh, at this point in time in history, uh, the two groups, Israel on the north and Judah in the south, have even fought some battles. And this is a point in time in history when Israel, the northern kingdom, is actually experiencing a time of prosperity. Their boundaries have, have enlarged from an economic point of view, from a military point of view, from a political point of view. They're actually doing pretty well. In fact, uh, probably as well as they've done in a century since Solomon was king over united Israel. And so uh, we're looking at the seven, again, the 790 to 750 range is when Jonah was around as a prophet. Israel as a northern kingdom is doing pretty well from an economic and political and military point of view. In fact, Second Kings, which chronicles this era of Jonah's uh, prophet, uh, his, his time, his life, uh, says that Jonah, that God had, despite what God had done as far as Jeroboam, and, and God says that Jeroboam the second, the king during this time, was an evil man. But God had also, through Jonah, told Israel that the borders would in fact expand, that they would in fact have blessing and success during this time period. So Jonah was a guy, a prophet, who was known as 2 Kings. He's mentioned briefly in 2 Kings chapter 14 as being one that God had spoken through to tell Israel that the borders would in fact be enlarged. And now that being said, while the northern kingdom was having success during Jonah's day, uh, Jeroboam II, who is now king, is by all accounts of the scripture an evil king that God despises. In fact, in 1 Kings, I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 14, it talks about how, and uh, 13, talks about how Jeroboam II had continued the sins of the first Jeroboam. Now, what does that mean? What's it referring to? Now, let me just give you a quick glimpse, This because this is important for us to understand what's going on in Jonah's day. So the first Jeroboam, the one who led the revolt against Solomon's son and established the northern kingdom, and all that's recorded in the book of 1 Kings. And in 1 Kings chapter 12, Jeroboam has set up his kingdom in the north and for political reasons, he doesn't want the people of Israel going south to Jerusalem to the kingdom of Judah to worship. He wants to keep all the worship, all the religious exercises up in the northern ten tribes. So it's, it's, a, it's a political, it's a cultural thing that Jeroboam has going on. So to keep the people of Israel from going down south to Judah to the other kingdom, he does this. The king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, it is too much for you to go down to Jerusalem. Behold, your gods, Israel, that brought you up in the land of Egypt. He set one golden calf in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Now this became a sin for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And after uh, Jeroboam the first does this, after he sets up his kingdom in the northern part of the ten tribes, and he doesn't want his people going down south to worship down there. So he sets up two golden calves and says, these are the gods that brought you out of, out of Egypt. Now that should just be, bring to mind all kinds of problems uh, going back to the Exodus and Aaron building the golden calf in the, in the wilderness. So we see all this. We see the problem here. Well, God gives Jeroboam a chance to repent. Uh, Jeroboam ultimately does not repent. And in 1 Kings chapter 13, it says, after this event, Jeroboam did not return from his evil way, but again he made priests of the high places from among all the people. Any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. This event became sin in the house of Jeroboam, even to blot it out and destroy it off the face of the earth. So he maintained, after an opportunity to repent, he maintained the illegal priesthood and the worship of idols. This is the sin of Jeroboam the first. When we get to Jonah's day, now we have Jeroboam the second, who is now king. And the Bible says that he continued in the ways and in the sin of Jeroboam the first. So in Jonah's day, when the events of this book take place, Israel is participating in the sin of idolatry under the leadership of King Jeroboam the second. Now it's a time where on the one hand, Politically and militarily, they are having 
quite a bit of success. On the outside, you would look at them and go, things are going really well. But God has said repeatedly in 1st and 2nd Kings that Israel is evil and Jeroboam is evil, and God is going to bring judgment on, on them eventually. But right now, things look good. So we have this interesting little thing going on. We have Jonah selling, telling them that God is saying the batteries are going to expand, and they did. They're having blessing, and they are. At the same time, God is telling them that he thinks they're evil in his sight. Just It's kind of an interesting little thing there. I know we tend to assume that if a nation is doing well, if people are successful materially speaking, that means they must be right with God. And if things are going badly, that they must be wrong with God. Remember, we just spent an entire three months in Job talking about that idea. So it's a reminder to us that just because there is success from a human point of view, it doesn't necessarily mean that things are good in God's eyes. Well, that's where things are going on. Well, that's what's going on in Jonah's world. Now, he is a contemporary. There is another prophet in particular that's going on in northern Israel, the same time Jonah is. He goes by the name of Amos. We see him also in the Old Testament. Most of Amos' uh, teaching and preaching is very uh, judgmental. He is warning the people of Israel that uh, they need to turn from their idolatry. He, he speaks to the oppression of the rich against the poor. And Amos talks about the injustice of the leadership of Israel against the uh, lower classes, if you will. So uh, you've got these messages going on in Israel. You've got, uh, on the one hand, uh, military political success. On the other hand, you have God warning and sharing with them that they are in trouble if they don't get things turned around from a spiritual point of view. So this is all what's going on in Jonah's world. So who's Jonah himself? We know from 2 Kings and from the book of Jonah that he is the son of a guy by the name of Amittai. Amittai is a name that literally means faithful. Ironic names in Jonah will probably prove to be less than faithful. Jonah is from a town called Gathifer, which is just in the area around Nazareth, a town that you are probably familiar with. So Jonah is from northern Israel. He's from outside Nazareth, that area. His dad's name means faithful. Jonah's name, the name Jonah means dove. And of course, that's going to be a, a name or a I mean, we might think of, we think of the dove that Noah sent out from the ark that brought back the olive branch, signifying that God had let the waters recede and it was about time for them to get off the ark. And we can think of perhaps the dove, uh, the Holy Spirit coming out in the form of a dove upon Christ when he was baptized by John the Baptist. But nonetheless, jo Jonah's name means dove. Jonah was a prophet that the only other message we have him delivered besides the book of Jonah is in 2 Kings, talking about the expanding of the borders of the nation of Israel. Um, so that's who Jonah is. Who were the Assyrians? God says here in verse 2 that Jonah is to rise, to rise up and go to Nineveh, which is a great city in the nation of Assyria. So who are the Ninevites? Who are the Assyrians? Uh, this is a nation to the north-northeast of Israel. Uh, at this point in history, they are not at their peak powers, uh, but they are going to be an approaching enemy uh, to the nation of Israel. In 722, um, they will be the people that come in and wipe out the nation of Israel. They will wipe them out completely. The northern ten tribes never fully exist again as a nation after 722. So Assyria will be the ones that will wipe them out. At that point in time in history, in 722, Nineveh serves as the capital. At this point in time in history, all that hasn't happened yet. Um, but that to be said, the Ninevites and the Assyrians are not good people. They are notorious for their violence and uh, what we might call their immorality. They are a corrupt, evil people. So that is their reputation. And there is going to be a lot of conflict between them and the Israelites over the, over the years. So Jonah shows up on the scene. Um, we have uh, him being known to prophesy good things for Israel. And we have here God coming to him and saying, now I don't want you to go to Israel. I want you to go to another nation, a nation who will be considered an enemy, if you will, and I want you to prophesy them, prophesy against them, tell them that judgment is coming. 
Now that on the surface of it sounds like a good thing. You might think Jonah's going to be, yeah, I'd love to tell them that they got something coming for them. And that sounds like it might be something you expect. I mean, after all, Jonah's going to be assuming he's preaching good things to Israel and he's preaching judgment to the enemies of God's people. That seems to be a natural idea. That's something that Jonah would kind of jump at. And yet we see that Jonah here does not only not get excited about this, he actually runs the opposite direction. So God tells him to go to Nineveh to preach against it. Jonah not only does not want to do it, he runs the other direction. Now, we're just going to pause here and look at some big picture views of what's going on before we get into details in the coming weeks. So what's happening here? What, what's going to cause Jonah to do this? Let's pull back from the overview and do an overview of the book of Jonah. What are some themes? Jonah has spoken on God's behalf as a prophet before. We know that from 2 Kings. Again, the only message we're aware of otherwise is that he's, pre he's preached a, a message of prosperity and success. Uh, he was preaching God's word. He was faithful to that, but that was the message he was, he was doing. Um, secondly, uh, Amos and even Hosea were around in that same era, and their messages tend to be more along the lines of Israel needs to repent. So Jonah's kind of preaching, uh, seems to be preaching a message of, of, of success for Israel, while Amos and Hosea are preaching warnings to, to the people of Israel all during the same time. Jonah did have a, a, an accurate knowledge of who God is and who God, uh, what God was going to do. Now, how do we know this? Because if we were to go to Jonah chapter 4 near the end of this book, and God has, has uh, decided to have grace upon them because they've repented, and Jonah is upset about that. And Jonah says that he didn't want to go to, to Nineveh because he said, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. In other words, Jonah didn't go to Nineveh, not because he didn't want to preach a, a message of judgment. He knew that if he preached a message of judgment and Nineveh repented, that God would forgive them. And Jonah does not want God to forgive the people of Assyria. He does not want God's compassion on the people of Nineveh. Now, it's kind of interesting. God is in the middle, in that point in time in history, of showing a great deal of compassion and grace to Israel. They are at the same time spiritually bankrupt, morally bankrupt, evil in God's eyes, and yet he's giving them a measure of success. So Israel is experiencing the overflowing and overabundance of God's grace and compassion, his slowness to anger. They are not getting what they deserve. And Jonah seems to be fully aware of that. And Jonah does not want that same measure of grace extended to the enemies of Israel, in particular, Nineveh and Assyria. And that's why he doesn't want to go. Jonah is able to look past the sins of Israel, or he sees the sins of Israel as less evil, less bad, if you will, than the sins of Nineveh. Tim Keller says it this way, Jonah wants a God of his own making, a God who simply smiles or smites, a God who simply smites the bad people and blesses the good people. For instance, Jonah and his countrymen are the good people. When the real God, not Jonah's counterfeit God, keeps showing up, Jonah is continually thrown into fury or despair. Jonah finds the real God to be an enigma because Jonah cannot reconcile the mercy of God with Jonah's idea of justice. Um, Jonah wants his people to receive mercy for their sins, but not the enemies of Israel mercy for their sins. He sees somehow Israel to be less sinful, so he wants other people's sins judged, but not his. Now, there is an additional thing. Uh, in addition to all this, there is a larger truth about Israel. Uh, this past Sunday morning, as we were looking in the first chapter of Acts, we've, we've got a new series in Acts over the last couple of weeks on Sunday mornings. Uh, we, we looked at the idea, and we saw that as Christ is calling the apostles to be 
uh, witnesses. He's empowering them to be witnesses there in Acts chapter 1. But this idea of God's people being witnesses, and that even being their primary task, is not a new one. In the book of Isaiah, uh, God repeatedly talks about how Israel is to be his witness to the nations so that the nations will come to Zion, will come to Jerusalem, and worship God. Even we go back to Genesis chapter 12, when God first establishes his covenant with Abraham, we see that part of what was going on there was that Abraham's descendants were to be a blessing to the nations. So it's always been God's plan from the very beginning to not simply work in Israel, but to have Israel be something that God uses to minister to the nations. God's people have a task, and that task is to be a witness, which is essentially what God's asking Jonah to do here. But Jonah doesn't want to do that. The idea of a witness was always supposed to be one of the prime roles of Israel. Yet Israel had not only forsaken that task of being a witness, they had also turned to worshiping false gods. And in this case, in the case of Jonah's era under Jeroboam II, they were worshiping golden calves. So Jonah is a reminder, as a whole book, as a story, it's a reminder to us that God has not forgotten the role that he assigned to Israel, that of being a witness, a mouthpiece for God, if you will, to the nations. So, as we begin this study and proceed through Jonah in the next few weeks, here are some questions I want us to close out with tonight. These are some things I just want you to, to think through, maybe even write down and, and think through. Are we only interested in God's word when it makes us feel better or seems to work towards our comfort or our material benefit? Again, Jonah's day, he likes it fine when his prophecies mean good for Israel, but he's not too sure he likes it when it's not that. So that's a question for us. Are we most comfortable or only interested in God's word when it seems to make us look good and make others look bad, when it works to our benefit and, and uh, makes us feel better? So there's question number one. Question number two. Are we only interested in grace, compassion, when it benefits us, and not those who have hurt us. You and I are generally most welcoming of grace when it comes to forgiveness for our own sins. Are we as eager to accept grace or to distribute grace when it means those who have hurt us are forgiven? That's question number two. Question number three. What gods of this world around us have we worshipped instead of God himself? What false God have we constructed for ourselves? And the, the last question is very similar to that. Are we, you and I, as God's people, are we witnesses to this world of God as he is or, as God, or to God as we want him to be? See, for Jonah, what God is and what God's going to do is not something he particularly likes. And he's going to fight against what God has told him to do because he doesn't like what God is doing to those that he considers to be enemies. Jonah wants his own people to be blessed and forgiven for their sins, but not others. He wants his own people to be comfortable and receive God's blessings, but not others. And so to that end, he has constructed for himself, knowingly, a God who will only do what he wants him to do. So here's our four questions again, one more time. Are we only interested in God's word when it makes us feel better or seems to work towards our material comfort? Are we only interested in grace, compassion, when it benefits us and not those who have hurt us? What gods of this world around us have we worshipped instead of God himself? What false gods have we constructed for ourselves? Are we witnesses to the world of God, to the world for God, or witnesses of the God we want him to be? I don't know about you, but those questions hit me pretty hard this afternoon. So some things to look at, some overarching pictures of the book of Jonah. Next week we'll dive into more detail as we look at the rest and the balance of chapter one and Jonah's uh, running away from God. I thank you for taking a few moments to spend with me this evening as we introduce ourselves to the story, to the account of Jonah as given in God's word. I want to remind you that this coming Sunday morning we are again meeting in person, 1015 here at the church. 
We are still abiding by those initial guidelines set up for phase one here in Arkansas. That does mean that our chairs are spaced out at a distance. It also means that we're wearing masks. We have uh, lots of hand sanitizing stations around. Uh, we are doing everything we can to keep things as safe and sanitary as possible for anybody who would love to be here. We've had a wonderful time the last couple of weeks, so I encourage you to be able to be here this coming Sunday morning at 1015. We're still gonna be online right here uh, on our Facebook page or even on our website. And just one more quick note. I mentioned on Sunday morning something called One Day. This is a large one day missions event taking place here in the River Valley, the first weekend of October. And we are gonna be both, uh, both a host church. We got things going on here in London as people from around the state of Arkansas come here. But we'll also be sending out folks from our church to be part of things going on throughout the Russellville the River Valley Association. So if you have not signed up for that yet, or you'd like to get some more information, give us a all give us a call here at the church office. Email me, could give us a call, and we will talk to you about all that. Guys, I'm so grateful that you are here again with us tonight. Please be in prayer for our nation, for our country, and uh, we'll talk to you again on Sunday. God bless.